How many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? And of course, you know, that is my very favorite question. And my goal with this video and every video that I create is to show you what's really happening beneath the surface of what you're actually being told. Because you know, I also talk a lot about perception management. And today, I'm going to show you how the level of lies is increasing while the level of risk to your fiat money investment continues to increase. And of course, we're going to talk about the best way to protect yourself and your wealth and your family. All of that and so much more coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading, a full-service gold and silver dealer specializing in custom strategies to help you thrive and survive the crisis that has already begun to unfold. Now, before we get deeply into this video, which today, you know, I mean, the reason why I'm really doing it is because there's a very significant part of the market that the perception is of safety. And I'm talking about the municipal bond market. And that goes directly to the states. And it's important for all of us to understand because how do states generate income? They tax you. So you need to really be clear on what's going on. And the way that the other way is by bonds. Now there are two types of municipal bonds. One is the GO or general obligation bonds. And that is repaid from taxes. So if they're running out of money, they're going to increase your taxes, reduce your benefits to make good on those bonds. And that's why those are you know, considered really safe. The other kind is revenue bonds, and that gets repaid based upon the revenue from the facility that they raise that debt to create. What you're looking at is a map, and you can see that there are three states that issue most of the debt, and this is just from 2018. This today is really a 6.96, almost a $7 trillion market. Most of that since 2008, about two and a half times that. But you have three states that are the most heavily indebted, California, Texas, and New York. And then a lot of other states that aren't too far from that, like Colorado and Florida and Illinois, which is a big one. Uh, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Massachusetts. It's not to say that the rest of them aren't, but those are the most heavily indebted states, and you can see that there's a red uh, star on there. And I'm going to show you why that's important. But when you're talking about the two different levels of bonds, general obligation or the GEO bond, that's only roughly a quarter of the issuance of bonds. By a very wide margin, most of the others are made up of revenue bonds. So the facility, because it's not just the state that can issue those, it could be a private educational corporation that wants to build dormitories or a new building or, or something like that, that would also then issue that municipal bond. And in fact, this goes up to 2018, so not the full year, but this dark part in here is refunding, which means that they are raising new money to pay off old debt, which could certainly be an indication of fiscal stress in the state. The lighter blue area is uh, current, is, would be brand new debt to fund a new project or a new bond. This star indicates where we're at 2008. So you can see that the level of refunding or rolling that debt over has grown 
pretty substantially since the crisis. Even though we're told how much better things are and that we're not near a recession, well, I mean, you get to formulate your own opinion of that, but I don't think we ever came out of the crisis. All of that new money was obviously not particularly stimulating for the individual states. But what it was stimulating for was an increase in the level of debt. People are uncomfortable right now. They're nervous about what's going on and they're flying to safety. But it's kind of like out of the frying pan into the fire because a lot of people, especially when they have more wealth, fly to the perceived safety of municipal bonds. They're told very often that the default rate on those bonds is small, but I'm gonna show you what the truth is in just a minute. However, what you do need to know is this is 2018. Look at how much inflowed into muni bond mutual funds ETFs in 2019 at the highest level ever because people are really looking for safety. A lot of that, because they're also looking for yield, a lot of the people that buy muni bonds buy it for their tax-free income, although there are certainly taxable muni bonds, but it's still a relatively small part of that market. Another story for another day. So most of this money, by a very wide margin, has flown into junk and unrated muni bonds. So you can see clearly from this graph, because this is just going through uh, September, mid-September, how much of that money that have flown into muni bonds have gone into investment grade as well as junk. And junk far surpasses it. And as we know, how do bonds work? Oops, I usually do it this way. Okay, when interest rates go down, the value of the bonds go up. When interest rates go up, the value of the bonds go down. So as money has flooded in and been buying up those bonds, it has pushed interest rates on those high yield bonds as well as the other, all of the other bonds, frankly, to historically low levels. Really, as we've seen with corporate debt or other debt, we are not getting paid for the real risk that we are taking. So just to kind of summarize this whole piece, as investors that don't think they have any choice other than inside of the markets, have flown to the perceived safety of municipal bonds, that has pushed, that has pushed the price up and the yields down. So you are not getting paid for that risk. But it also hides the truth because it used to be that most in this market were individuals, mom and pops. But I'm gonna show you in just a couple of minutes how that has changed. So when the price on the bonds have gone up, it can cover up a lot of defaults on those bonds. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. But first, I want to show you, because some of you that have been watching me for a long time might recall the study that I did back in 2013 on muni bonds from a New York Fed piece, the untold story of municipal bond defaults. Part of the reason is because grading services only report the defaults on the bonds that they grade. So if they don't grade them, they don't report on the default on them. So in this particular report, where Moody's said that there were 71 defaults, according to the New York Federal Reserve, during that same period of time, there were 2,521 defaults. So what do you believe? Do you believe Moody's at 71 or the New York Fed at 2521? Now, lest you think, oh, but that was back in 2012. Surely it's gotten better. Well, this is a, a new study by the Brookings Institute, and they're saying the same thing. You'll find both of those links in the blog. I 
suggest that you read these reports or at least the most current one because the trend is really clear that the risk of defaults in muni bonds is growing and it's growing exponentially but again when the yields are artificially pushed down the price of the bond goes up so if you're sitting in a bond fund and all you do is open it up and look at your statement to determine whether or not everything is okay you are not seeing the whole story you are not seeing the defaults that are taking place in those high yield bonds but that is without a doubt the trend that's going on and like corporate bonds when people are searching for yield i mean a lot of people that buy muni bonds they're doing it for the tax-free income so if you're not getting paid anything on a municipal bond and you don't realize the level of risk you're taking for that itty bitty teeny weeny pickup in interest what they have found is that the growth in non-rated so these are bonds that have just been created and sold to one of five most of it one of five key uh, municipal uh, institutional investors which i'll show you in a minute by 2019 and honestly i could not find the data going back before 2016 when 30 percent of the high yield index was in these unrated bonds now it's over 55 percent 55 percent in an index against which a lot of these mutual funds and etfs are gauged or they buy did you know that do you own any of this stuff because if it says high yield what that really means and i don't care if it's corporate or it's a municipal or it's anything else as soon as you see the word high yield immediately think of junk now maybe you like junk i'm not one that does my preference is for quality but you are probably sitting in that the appetite for muni debt includes less traditional offerings in which governments extend their tax exempt borrowing power to efforts to build or renovate things like hospitals dormitories energy plants malls stadiums okay and those are classified as municipal bonds and they indeed are a lot of what's coming out as not as, as unrated or high yield they're all junk it's based upon the repayment capacity of that entity whether it's a dormitory or a mall or whatever it is they carry a lot more risk and the number of issuers that are reporting defaults is growing this is 2000 all of 2018 this is already 2019 up until the end of august that's a pretty big jump and we haven't finished out the year yet and it's still in an environment where it's easy to roll over that debt as we just saw the poopy has not yet hit the fan but I promise you at some point and probably some point very soon, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, it will. The Muni debt, and this is what I'm about to show you is super significant because the share of Muni debt that is already in defaults, while we might think that it would be the high yield and the junk, and clearly that is the highest level of default, but look at the increasing level of default in what's considered investment grade because now I don't have proof of this so I'm about to tell you my opinion however I do have proof that the grading agencies like Moody's and S&P and all those guys have lowered their credit quality and allowed corporations that should have been downgraded to junk to maintain a triple B or a minimum level of investment grade. My bet would be that we're seeing the same thing here because you're not the one that pays the, 
the grading services, it's the counties, it's the corporations, it's the states. That's who pays these entities. So obviously it is in their best interest to give them the highest grade as possible because then they have to pay the least amount of interest as possible and they get to retain more of that debt issuance. I am gonna take questions after this, so if you have questions about anything, please, about, well, not about anything, but about this particular topic, please type it in and Megan will put it up on a sheet that will go over at the end of it. Because what you also need to understand is that the time period between the issuance and default is getting really shorter and shorter and shorter. And in fact, 43%, whether they're investment grade, this blew my mind, 43%, whether they're investment grade or high yield junk bonds, uh, municipal bonds have reported uh, what they call a default. Well, what we'd all call a default within three years of issuance. Within three, count them, three years of issuance, they're already in default. I mean, let that sink in for a minute and the ramifications of it. And in fact, through July of 2019, 33 municipal bond issues have defaulted the fastest pace since 2015 and up from 21 during the same period in 2018. Do you see what I'm trying to show you here? Now, the entity that oversees all of the municipal bonds and analyzes it and reports on it is the municipal bond and uh, municipal market analytics. And the head of that is Tom Doe. And I quote, God help us if there's a recession. Because all of this municipal debt would be in jeopardy. Remember, general obligation bonds are based upon the taxes that they can bring in. Well, look at there's only so much tax that you can squeeze out of an individual. And what's happened in a number of the higher tax states has been an exodus to lower tax states. Like Illinois, Chicago would be a great example of that. So if people are leaving the higher tax states, then those that stay are going to have to pay higher taxes. And they're also going to have to cut, uh, cut benefits. If any of you out there have experienced that in any state that you're living in, or if you're from Chicago, because I know a lot of that has been happening there, we've reported on that in the past, please, if you wouldn't mind sharing your experience with us, because people need to know this. In a new study, and this was conducted by the Census Bureau or an arm of the Census Bureau, nearly two in three finance officers in large cities now protect, predict a recession as soon as 2020. This was just done this month. This survey just came out this month. We're in October. We're at the end of October. So November, December. This does not look good. And in the meantime, we know that states are in a pension crisis. So going back to that state map, only eight states were at least 90% funded. Those would be the lightest color in there. Those states, a few of them, Idaho, Utah, South Dakota, etc. You could go in and you can see all of these maps in detail. We're 90% funded. But everybody else was less than that. And in fact, 24 states were below 70% funded in their pensions. Well, you know, here's the thing. You might recall this, but I'm going to go over it so that you understand this a little bit differently. Because there are two types of debt. There is self-liquidating debt and there is non-self-liquidating debt. What are they? What's the difference between them? Well, 
If you take on debt, let's say you own a business and you take on debt and you expand your business, you hire more people and then you get more customers, then you make more money, that new income liquidates that debt. And at some point you're out of debt. But non-self-liquidating debt would kind of be like a bomb. You know, it costs millions and millions to build a bomb. You use it once and that's it. How are you going to recoup that money? You can't. It's non-self-liquidating. What I found really interesting when I looked at this graph and I started so you could see for yourself that in that first graph, you'll notice that the largest issuers of muni bonds, many of them are the largest, have the largest pension shortfall. Uh-oh, this is a huge problem. So what you're looking at are those that match that first graph for the largest issuers. These are the, the states that have the largest pension shortfalls. So how are they going to fund this pension? Well, I'm thinking that they're going to come out with POBs, pension obligation bonds. This is all non-self-liquidating debt. All of that money that they will raise will go out to pay the pension obligations that they have already, these people are already retired. So how do you rebuild that? Well, you can't really. Higher taxes, reduce benefits, maybe they'll cut the pension benefits. If anybody has experienced that, please share because people need to know that this happens. And it's not an accident that the jurisdictions that typically uh, issue pension obligation bonds are also usually financially the most vulnerable. Who is ultimately going to pay for that? The pensioners will because there's probably going to have to be a decline in benefits. But the taxpayers will. And especially the property taxes. What I know is that history teaches us that one of the things regarding real estate, which is not an asset that you can put on your back and walk away with. It's not, they call it an immovable property. Well, it is. You can't put it on your back and move. So therefore, what ends up happening is that property taxes explode. That's what happens. You have to be prepared to pay those property taxes or you will lose that property. That happened quite a bit during the depression in this country where even if the mortgage was paid in full, you didn't owe one penny on the house, you still had those property taxes. So. Being able to always pay those property taxes is part of the strategy that I developed for myself that we share with you. You need to know, well, how much do I need? So that's part of it. And we're happy to help you with it because they've got to figure, they've got to fund their spending some way. They don't really go out and work. They use your money. But here is another huge piece of this puzzle that you really, really, really need to understand because we think we have lots of choices, but in reality, and particularly since the 90s, there have been more and more and more consolidations so that the power and the money flow really flows through typically just a few hands. And where individual mom and pops used to make up the lion's share of the muni bond market, that's not so anymore. Now, by a very wide margin, it's just these five firms. So if you own any of this stuff, that would be Vanguard, TIAA Crest, also known as Nuveen, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, and New York Life Insurance. Now, what I want you to understand about this too, during the 2008 crisis, Goldman Sachs, became a bank so that they could have access to the central bank window. They have been aggressively expanding 
their uh, footprints into more normal kind of people's markets and generating uh, deposits. So they've become a deposit taking bank, which means that they're also covered by FDIC insurance. But here is a big key. They're also classified as a GSIB, which is a global systemically important bank. So that means that they are incestuously interconnected with the rest of the global banks. What do you think might happen if there is a run? Because frankly, funds that hold the risky municipal bonds are growing with more than half of that debt of the risky default, the ones that have a tendency to default the most, though everything is defaulting. Well, not everything is defaulting, but you saw the trend in the defaults. They're concentrated just in these five names. And the reality is, is when everybody runs for the exits at the same time, no one wants to be the buyer of last resort. Too bad, so sad. What you think is liquid today is likely not to be so liquid tomorrow. Right now with all that money coming in, it's not a problem. But what happens when the reverse happens? Well, if you're left holding the bag, it's like a hot potato, it's gonna be in your hands. Because what's really happened is that this base of buyer has gotten a whole lot more narrow. In my opinion, you of course must do whatever you're comfortable with, but I want the kind of wealth that has the broadest base of buyer. For fiat money products, it only has value in one place, and that is the Wall Street, the fiat money markets. Physical gold and physical silver has the broadest base of buyer because you have manufacturing, you have the central banks, you have jewelry, you have art, you have food, you have medicine, you have et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Physical gold and silver has, thing, has attributes that they have never been able to duplicate in any lab and of everything, that's why it holds its value. It has the broadest base of buyer. As the consolidation in the municipal bond in all of these fiat money products, frankly, it's not just here, it's really everywhere. As the consolidation has continued, even if they have all these different names, no, no, no. The power is held in just a few hands. And when push comes to shove, as we've seen, they're going to look to protect themselves first, which means, nope, you can't liquidate. No buyers. Going back to the states, I also thought this was really interesting because we do know that there are 11 states that have given gold and silver back its legal tender status. The only one that was on the list of the highest level of debt in issuance, along with the worst funded pensions that have also legalized gold and silver as legal tender is Texas. I think that's kind of interesting. Not the rest of them. So, I don't know, perhaps Texas is at least trying to do something on some level because they've also, uh, they've also built um, vaults to hold the physical metals themselves and become their own central bank, not being held off premises. Which we know, if you don't hold it, you don't own it. And I don't care what your perception is, when push comes to shove on all of this other stuff, you are merely the beneficial owner. You are not the legal registered owner. And all this other stuff, when you hold your wealth there and you hold your equity there, everybody between Seed and Company or DTC at the top of the pyramid and you at the very bottom, every entity and subsidy Subs, uh, subs, subsidy, subsidiary, sorry about that, 
subsidiary between DTC and you are also beneficial owners. And they get to take that equity and use it to borrow and then they can do anything that they want with the money. So what do you think? Think back to 2008. This game is not over yet. It has simply been postponed. And my concern is, is that when push comes to shove, again, it's going to be the normal people that are left holding the bag. And that's not okay with me. How many times can you be lied to when you do not know the truth? The answer is every single time, but now you know. So if you are sitting in, in municipal bonds, if they're individual bonds, you should see how they're able to be repaid and, and who issued them. If they're in some of these ETFs or these funds, you better look deeper because you are not getting paid for the risk that you are taking. And they know it. And, and during all this time, your protections have also been reduced because all you're looking at is the yield. Do you still trust them? Do you still trust Wall Street? I hope not, because I sure don't. And I used to be a part of it. I was a broker. I was a banker. I know how these guys work. So Williams asks, should we avoid all bonds right now? Well, yes, because a bond is a debt instrument and the problem is debt. And I, I'm not going to have a chance to talk about it this week, but there could be a shift in the interest rates that are happening. So I, I will make sure, Megan, would you um, make sure and send me an email or a text? And I definitely need to do something on what's happening in Japan and Europe and with interest rates. Okay, so I'll, I'll make that happen like very, very quickly because you need to know. Um, you do whatever you're comfortable with, but I don't own any bonds, nor would I go out and buy any bonds, even though we are probably going to negative rates. And remember, when they push those rates down, the principal goes up. The problem is not what's going to happen with your principal. Well, well, that is the problem, because if, if there are no buyers of last resort, your principal is going to be stuck inside the system. And legally, there's not going to be anything you can do about it. And April asks, should I close money market savings? <sighs> well, you know, we're talking a lot about what's happening in the repo market. And remember that money markets, you know, now the Fed is flooding the system. But typically money markets, what you deposit into money markets are going into the repo market. And the repo market is freezing. Now, this is a question that also came up you know, yesterday, um, because in money markets, you have the short term corporate money markets, and then you have the short term, well, you want to make sure the short term government money markets. And if it's, if it consists of, of T bills, they don't have the gates and the fees on them like they do on the other money markets, but why you see this pain in my face is because any wealth that you hold in the system, and I don't care where you hold it, even in what you perceive as safe, the money markets, it's not safe. They have not gotten control over the, the blockage in liquidity in these markets. And, you know, they ask, well, what's the difference between Q? It doesn't matter what the name is. There's a lot of new money that's being created and thrown into those repo markets because that market is freezing. And it was the freezing of the, I think it was the prime fund in 2008 that prompted the change in all of the rules around money markets. So, I mean, it's, it's up to you. I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you I don't own any money markets. I feel more comfortable with cash because they're not paying you for the risk either. With cash outside of the system that you hold in a vault near you. It can be a private vault. Here in Phoenix, there are two. And so that makes it pretty easy. And that's where I hold all of my stuff is off of my premises because I'm too visible. You guys know this. So I hold it in a private vault. But there's probably, look for 
private safe deposit boxes or private vaults near you and whatever you would hold in a money market you might want to consider holding there because it's easy enough to always make a deposit and they're not paying you to take the risk and Dan asks how do we check our local county for muni problems I live in New York State thanks for the info as I have thought we were in trouble from all the borrowing and especially in Aunt Ananda I was I was in Kingston I'm not really familiar is that more probably toward Niagara Falls or or more north uh, but I was in Ulster County but uh, actually there's a link that's not alive anymore but in here there's that link to the Census Bureau survey so you can go on and look for that or you can give if you have a relationship developed with one of our strategy specialists you can ask them because they have access to all these links as well but yeah New York State is really heavily in debt and um, you know I'm from New York originally so I do have a little you know a little bit of a I guess love affair you never get rid of being a New Yorker but um, yeah that that's how you would basically do it you'll be able to see what the bond is um, backed by and the okay corral is a oh, what is beneficial owner okay a beneficial owner means that you have some rights so for example if you have like a mutual fund or an individual stock or something like that that is held inside of a brokerage account or a bank account something like that then actually as soon as you make that deposit or as soon as it's held on there if you look on your new account statement it'll tell you that you become a beneficial owner your benefit is that they will pass through any uh any um if there's going to be a vote you would they'd pass through your voting rights if there's a dividend they'll pass that through legally they actually don't have to because the legal owner is the registered owner and they're really the ones that have the most rights so the beneficial owner means that you have some benefits of ownership but you do not have all the benefits of ownership right now part of those benefits and because they want you to feel like you actually own something is you can buy it and you can sell it pretty much when you want however as we've been seeing different funds that have shut down and halted liquidations well then we know who really owns that so beneficial owner makes you feel like you're you're an owner and you do get some benefits from that but you don't have the absolute legal status of ownership and I hope I explained that okay so okay I guess that's it for the moment yep we're good and uh, make sure that you visit our blog and I would take some time especially for those that want to understand where you're at there's a lot of great links in this particular PowerPoint where you can go to your individual states and you can see what's happening uh, if they don't satisfy that need give one of us a call you know give us a call and we'll do our best to help you get the information that you're looking for if you own any of these ETFs or any of these mutual funds uh, you can dig deeper into their prospectus you can get that online to see actually what they're holding and I'd say how they're rated but again as we knew in the run-up to the 2008 crisis I mean the crisis started a lot earlier than 2008 it just became obvious to everybody in 2008 for some of us that were paying attention we saw it coming and it really it well in 2005 I remember writing in August of 2005 there were technical indicators about the breakdown in the real estate market which was the trigger to all of those derivatives so you know people think and even when I say reset 
and I'm going to do a little 101 on reset. I want you to understand inflation is a way of resetting the value of your money that you work for and that you try to save on an ongoing basis. So, you know, a lot of people think that when I use the term reset, that it only has to be something violent. No, they don't really want it to be violent because by the time it gets there, well, number one, you know about it. But what you really need to keep in mind about that is it's too late for you to take any action. It's too late. The time to take the action is now while you still have your options open. So if you have any other questions, you can send them to us at questions at itmtrading.com. Again, make sure you visit our blog, itmtrading.com forward slash blog. And uh, make sure you subscribe. If you like this, please give us a thumbs up and make sure you share because I think a lot of people, particularly that buy into muni bonds, they're just trusting a broker that frankly, I mean, I was a stockbroker. I know what that training is. They don't understand what's going on. Ask them, tell me how money's created and supported in this system. If they can't answer that simply like this, what backs the dollar? The full faith and credit of the U.S. government. So as long as you trust them, you have faith, you will continue to loan them money. That's the credit part. What backs these muni bonds? Well, the taxability, the ability of the state or the city or the county to tax you to get the money that they need to pay you if it's a GO bond. If it's a revenue bond, which you saw is the lion's share of the bonds that are issued, it's the revenue generated by whatever it was that you just funded. May be okay, may not be okay. Make sure that you know what the truth is so that they cannot lie to you anymore. Keep in mind that financial shields are made of physical gold and silver. And until tomorrow, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.